And we'll have about 10 minutes for discussion and questions. Any questions or discussions? Or I can, I can start off um, this, uh, for Steve. Um, how hard is it, would you say, to, um, to change the operation um, that you showed us uh, into a, uh, a one-sided operation? Is that, is that impossible, or is that just too dangerous to it's, do? I don't think it's possible with the um, ablation t techniques that we showed you. I think that the um, fusion device is the one potential um, device that has the opportunity to um, turn it into a one-sided procedure, and we're working with some others on um, trying to um, achieve that, um, uh, particularly if you're uh, of the notion um, uh, there's some been p p uh, papers published recently that suggest that uh, losing the right atrial lesion sets don't cost you much in efficacy, and if that's the case, then I think trying to make it a left-sided procedure only um, to create um, a lot, you can do a, with the fusion device, probably do a pretty good left-sided lesion set and ligate the appendage, and that may be the um, one cavity procedure of choice as time goes on. So you both talked about the, the benefit of the partnership with your electrophysiologist. So how do you, can you speak a little bit about how you initiated and effectuated that relationship? Uh, so it's complicated. <laughs> um, there are, uh, I think, uh, a percentage of electrophysiologists that just will never really understand the need for surgeons to be in this space. And um, and I'm not sure that that's an opinion. That's you know probably uh, a matter of their training and then uh, clinical experience. And I'm not sure you'll ever really change that. I think that um, the tenor of electrophysiology is beginning to change a little bit and I'm beginning to sort of move toward um, the possibility that there are multiple. Um, uh, ways to achieve these sorts of things, particularly in those electrophysiologists that are um, willing to believe that you can't fix everything with the catheter. Um, you know, the, we are starting to see it at more meetings at the ACC, at the HRS, that there's more input um, um, from surgeons and more discussion about surgeons and hybrid type procedures and that sort of thing. So I think that. Um, in general, electrophysiologists are starting to come to, around to the possibility that this is um, uh, this is a real possibility. Um, how you do that, um, as I've described to a lot of people who have um, either come visit us or ask us about this, how you do that depends on your environment. Uh, all politics are local, and so it depends on who you're working with. And so I think that starts with just kind of a collaborative environment. Um, how you achieve that varies. Um, sometimes it's a matter of, um, you know, uh, depending on what your, um, uh, what your clinical uh, and teaching setup is, it's a matter of, you know, attending conferences or having these conversations. I found the most important thing for us was our hybrid experience because I spent time in the EP lab. And I'm sure Sam will have to tell you the same story. Um, learning each other's uh, language, learning each other's um, techniques and limitations and strengths becomes a really important part of how you merge all this together. And then it has taken other forms as well. So um, uh, I've now, I am getting ready to do this at a second institution, but uh, so we've formed um, a multidisciplinary um, elect, uh, atrial fibrillation clinic, for instance, we use it for a lot of it, the Missouri, a lot of, we do it for VT, we do it for other things, but um, to have, uh, to take the time um, out of your clinical practice to um, staff a multidisciplinary clinic allows a lot of cross-fertilization, a lot of um, cross-referral, and that's the sort of thing that I think begins to allow you to work together and grow together and, um, and um, you know, really be able to clinically perform some of these hybrid type procedures. Eh? So, so do some of these, do these cases all get presented then in a multidisciplinary fashion? And They, they and can, they, they yeah. Can. I think, again, it depends on, you know, the your local situation. I mean, sometimes that's a phone call, sometimes it's a formal conference. I think that as long as you're starting to, each understands the other's um, uh, comfort zone, um, then you start to, 
understand that there are a select number of patients that are um, uh, that um, where a hybrid procedure may be a reasonable way to go. I'll, I'll echo that. I think uh, understanding their language, there's three things. One is understanding what they, when they speak about AFib, they have a completely different way to talk about it. So when I say box lesion, we understand that to mean a lesion around the, the top, usually. Those who use the, have used the microwave device in the past or the fusion device or the Cobra uh, usually have a lesion anterior to the veins and then on the dome and on the floor. When they say box lesion, they mean totally inferior to the veins. And so the anterior part of the veins are not isolated. And I didn't realize that until, you know, it, it took me a couple of years to understand that they were talking a completely different language. So number one is speak their language. Number two is uh, collaborate with them on other things. Because I think we have a lot to offer EPs. I have a whole nother talk about how a surgeon and electrophysiologist can collaborate in a hybrid way to take care of patients. And it includes, obviously, AFib. It, it includes VTAC. It includes lead management, either placement of leads when they can't get a, an LV lead through the coronary sinus, which happens very, very frequently. They call on us to use a robotic approach to place an LV lead, and you can do this on redos with really small endoscopic ports as opposed to having to do a mini thoracotomy or a maxi thoracotomy if it's a real redo. Um, and, and those work really well, and we can actually do it better than they because we can get to a better area. And then lead uh, removals. Extraction is becoming the thing, and getting involved in the ex extraction uh, process uh, is very helpful and I think saves a lot of patients' lives when we're involved uh, from the beginning. I think, Steve, you, you do this in your practice. Uh, you know, we utilize the Da Vinci robot, uh, put the patient on pump and open up the right atrium just like you saw and we basically take it from the top of the SVC down into the RV which prevents a lot of misery when, when you're involved uh, from the get-go. So I would say those kinds of things really will. And then the last thing, which is what Ralph said, Make sure that you treat atrial fibrillation in the patients that are already in your operating room. So if you have a mitral valve patient, an aortic valve patient, cabbage, whatever it is, take care of that AFib. If you're interested in, in working with lone AFib, uh, which to me is, is, is the holy grail uh, of all the things that we're doing, because I think lone AFib really is, is something that surgeons can, can do a lot to help, um, then do the concomitants because they're already there, and then you'll, you'll ingratiate yourself and, and give yourself credibility to do the loans. Sam, I have a question for you about, you were talking, showing the electroanatomic map um, and your uh, EP in the room uh, fighting it out with your robot. Um, have you had a chance to look at um, uh, early or intermediate term reconnection in those same day hybrid patients? We um, have, and I've mentioned, alluded to this a little bit in my talk, have had a um, sort of a phase shift in that. Our initial experience with um, hybrid ablation was a same day procedure. It made sense and everybody was there and that sort of thing. But what we found in our early experience was about 20% of patients ended up with um, pseudo block is what I call it, I guess. Um, there's enough edema that's created by these devices that um, uh, in, the electroanatomic map is fooled. And what we saw within two to six months is that all those patients tended to reconnect. And if we went back and restudied them, um, it was actually relatively small gaps that were created by the resolution of this edema that then um, could be um, the, where the lesion set could be completed. But if we let that... Um, surgical injury heal and waited till after sort of a blanking period that um, uh, that we could really do this with one EP study. Have you had that experience at all? Yeah, we actually have. And, and this case that I showed here where we had the gap uh, on the left veins was one of the few ones that we've demonstrated the absence of a block uh, immediately. So the majority of the cases we, we demonstrate block immediately, but when we have come back, you know, a month or, or two later, uh, they do have reconnection. And, and so I think the, the consensus amongst folks who do hybrid ablations in this manner is to basically delay the, the catheter uh, side of it to, uh, to a month later so that you can kind of see where the reconnections are and, and go after them. We, we actually have a couple of questions from the audience, or a few. Can't see them down there. But So uh, do you think these devices work for all atrium sizes? Is there one better for very large atria. Uh, I would suggest that that's a maze concept. And I think, uh, you know, what Dr. Cox has told us is um, that um, uh, these lesions or these lesions uh, affect macro entrance circuits that are probably in the order of two to four centimeters in size. That's generally what they've seen. So um, 
uh, clinically what we've said is that um, the uh, the macroventral circuits that are created in atrial, atrial sizes less than six centimeters are generally um, uh, completely ablated by this lesion set. So why uh, is, isn't the um, success rate 100 percent? Well, it's likely because some of Jimmy's data uh, would suggest that there may be smaller reentrant uh, circuits or um, uh, cafes or that sort of thing that we're not fixing with these macro lesion sets. So th that plus the clinical um, uh, data that we have that suggests that in atria, pick a number, but it's usually over six centimeters, the disorganization is such that it's unlikely that you'll be able to reorganize an atria that large. So I think that um, that's kind of the um, the ballpark, how you make that lesion, I don't think it matters. And I think in, in an atria that, um, uh, you know, is of a size less than that, these lesions are just as acceptable as, um, as a cut and sew lesion. The next question has to do with, uh, these are good results that are shown. Do you have them uh, with chronic cases too? I, I would say that the, uh, the, the, the more persistent or chronic, if you will, the patient is, the more uh, necessary it is to arrest the heart and uh, do uh, an open procedure, um, an open atrial procedure, as opposed to an off-pump, uh, um, you know, beating heart procedure. Unless you're under protocol and working tightly with the electrophysiologist uh, to do, um, you know, a hybrid catheter uh, process. Uh, and then when it gets to the really large atria, I think that even matters more. Uh, Niv Ad, who was here at this meeting last year. Uh, has published on massive uh, left atria, left and right atria, and whether or not it's appropriate to do a concomitant maze uh, procedure on those uh, using the cryoprobe, and uh, his results show that it that it probably is, uh, except for, you know, the most fragile of patients. Um, so, so I think uh, once you get into the chronic and the persistence, uh, it's probably uh, better to do a, a a true biatrial Cox maze four procedure. And how about the atrial reduction adjuncts? Does that add or offer much, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure it does necessarily. I think that, um, uh, you know, for, the, I think Sam's right. I think once you really get to a complex chronic sol uh, situation, the uh, most complete lesion set you can do is the is the right way to go. And, you know, it's not an uncommon thing for us to uh, <laughs> do an, a uh, poor man's left atrial reduction by a, a generous ligation of left atrial appendage and a generous closure of left atriotomy, and you can downsize a six and a half centimeter atria to four and a half or five centimeters pretty effectively. Whether that really changes atrial transport, whether that improves um, the efficacy of the maze procedure, I'm not sure that it necessarily does. How about the last question about ex exit block in the operating room? How important is it, and, and how does it uh, correlate with long term? Results. Go ahead. I know you can. <laughs> so it's um, I, I, it's a, a difficult situation. Ralph mentioned the same thing. Um, uh, we all are zealots, and so we're testing uh, our testing, and uh, we all believe that entrance block testing is absolutely critical. Exit block testing is great, though. You know, most of these patients are in long-standing persistent AFib, and to have to try to uh, cardiovert them successfully without a maze lesion set is uh, often not possible. So I think that we're interested in testing as much as we absolutely can. I think that's the best way to make sure that you've done the best thing that's going to be the most efficacious. Um, I, I just think that um, it's probably unrealistic to expect that you can convert a significant number of these patients pre-ablation to uh, accomplish both entrance and exit block testing. And I agree. I think uh, w the thing that I've learned by working with the EPs in the hybrid room is that uh, there is testing and then there's testing. And uh, when they test, they really test. So, so I've kind of uh, gravitated, and I didn't have any pictures of it here. I have other videos uh, to using a, uh, a 20 um, uh, my, uh, electrode uh, duo deca catheter that they use inside uh, the atrium and, and we've kind of started using it on the outside and that enables you to take actually multiple points of reference and you can kind of pace in one and sense in the other and it's amazing what you find you've isolated the posterior wall and you can actually see activity coming from the posterior wall but it does not uh, um, reach the pulmonary veins 
uh, and vice versa. And so, so, and then there's uh, st uh, stimulating with um, with various drugs uh, while testing uh, to really uh, uh, figure out if, if you've got a block. So there's a lot of different things that they do. Um, I, obviously, these things prolong the time of the operation, and um, you know uh, you have to kind of choose and, and pick whether or not it's significant. I think uh, if you don't have transmurality at the end of your procedure, it's probably not likely that you're going to have it in the long term. So in all likelihood, I think it's important. I don't know that we've actually been able to prove that. Um, but, uh, but I think electrical transmurality um, is, uh, is important for what we're doing, just to be on the same page with the electrophysiologist, just to be able to say, you know, we have an endpoint to our procedure. And when we don't have that, we don't ha when we don't have exit block or entrance block, we'll go back and, and burn again. Well, thanks very much for a great session and a great discussion. Uh, we'll take a break now. Please participate in uh, uh, some of the exhibits, and please uh, help yourself to refreshment. Thank you very much. Thank you.